This is a really, really fancy word that refers to the fear of penguins. Uh, so our little friend Tux is apparently intimidating to some. And this is a really, really fancy way of referring to people who just flat out don't like Linux. Um, but uh, all seriousness aside, or all kidding aside, uh, this talk I'm going to break down, break this uh, group of anti-Linux people down into two general categories. The first is um, the people who are afraid of using Linux, and then the second group is the people who actively don't like it and have a reason for not liking it other than they're scared of it. They think it's a bad thing to the world. Um, uh, starting with uh, those who are afraid of Linux, you're going to hear them say things like, I'm not smart enough to use Linux. I don't know how to use uh, the hacker's black box, as I've heard it called one too many times, which we call terminal or um, bash shell, whatever, what be you. Um, and then the, you'll hear things like, just Linux is too advanced for me, kind of the same thing as I'm, too, uh, I'm not smart enough. And then the people who just don't like it, people who think Linux is a bad thing for the world. Uh, pretty sure there was this 90s Windows conference that somebody said Linux is a cancer. Don't remember people names. But um, putting that aside, uh, I think we can all agree that's not the case. Uh, but they'll say things like Linux sucks and not the Brian Lunduke kind of way Linux sucks, more like the Linux is, I guess, a cancer in people shouldn't use it kind of Linux sucks. Um, they'll say things like, to you specifically or other Linux users, why go out of your way to do something on Linux when the, you can do the same thing on Microsoft Windows or Apple, what be you. Um, and then uh, despite it being classified as software, they'll say Windows is better, Windows is more secure. Uh, heard both of those before. Uh, both of which in my department at Georgia State University. Uh, we won't get into names, of course, though, uh, for the sake of anti-slander um, mentality. But uh, focusing first on the people who are afraid of Linux just because they're easier to talk to most of the time. They don't have this mental wall up that's just making it impossible to talk some kind of reason into them. First thing, which I guess goes for both types of Linux haters is uh, keep your, uh, the discussions that you have about Linux low stakes. If you're in like, uh, if you're working on a project with a group of nine or 10 people and you have a manager who's in charge of it all who never used Linux before and you're all going into this meeting, you have a deadline, everybody's stressed because you have a problem. You see, you being a Linux user, see a Linux solution to this problem and you want to bring it up, but when everybody's so irritated, angry in a mass group, and probably the other eight people plus the manager are using Windows or maybe a Mac, but bringing, bringing up this very different, or in their mind, very different solution is going to be a serious red flag. They're going to be thinking, whoa, 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 hold up. We're going to have to go back and almost start from square one, which may or may not be the case, but um, you know that you can get further with Linux. And the way I would approach this is try and get a one-on-one -on -one with that superior figure who can make these decisions happen and just go, maybe go into their office, shoot them an email and just be like, hey, I think I found a Linux solution here or if we use this distribution to do this, um, use this to release the product instead of a ARM version of Windows or something, um, I think we can get this project done a lot faster or a lot better. And what happens when you do this on a one-on-one? -on -one? That manager who's in charge, his reputation as the authority figure in the room isn't gonna be challenged. When you say, like, hey, we're doing this wrong, I think we need to, I think we need to switch to Linux and do this this way, you're basically telling him he's wrong. And nobody likes to be told they're wrong. So that's how to just be shut down really fast. And if you keep pressing, pressing the issue, it could lead to job loss, depending on the, extrem the extremity to which this is pushed. Uh, but um, it, it just keeps 
at minimum, it just keeps adding to the, the thickness of the wall that they're putting up against Linux. So um, another thing that when you go and talk to that authority figure about, hey, we should use Linux for this, or it's an option that we can explore, bring a demonstration. You're not gonna have a final product, obviously, because if your Linux distribution solved everything, then like, I, think, I would think that um, you probably would have went to it a while ago, because that would mean you wouldn't have to do much work at all. But um, being able to show that Linux has the potential to solve more problems than you've already fixed, uh, that shows progress, and it gives the manager or the team as a whole a reason to agree to explore that option further. So have some kind of demonstration, obviously. Um, keep it simple. Uh, people who haven't used Linux before, they're either thinking it's too advanced or it's still in that 1998 phase that's, to the average person, is just completely unusable. But as we all know, it's come such a long way even in the past four or five years. So um, that's a great thing, but keeping concepts really simple and explaining what things in ways that even if they are programmers, maybe explaining it in ways that programmers and developers don't typically think, maybe the average non-programmer thinks, it can establish a ground that more people can walk on, uh, so to speak. Um, and the final thing, which is uh, also pretty important, we all have to swallow our pride at some point in our lives and just accept that what we want to the like 100% to the T isn't going to happen, and when when it comes to picking a Linux distribution, Linux distribution to use at work for an entire team of developers or whatever you're doing um, or a department of computers, sometimes your favorite distribution, if you're an Arch, Arch Linux user, that's probably not going to be the best thing to use when you have a group of like 20 or 30 people who have never used Linux before in their lives. And I'm sure you could set it up for them, but in reality, Ubuntu might be the better option for that group of not so computer literate, behind the scenes type of people. And maybe if you're an Ubuntu, Ubuntu user or um, Debian, what, what be you? Sometimes when in a development setting, there's just no way around acknowledging that Fedora hat does have some strengths in there. It's usually pretty up to date with uh, uh, current software and it always is pr at least to some extent bleeding edge and developers like that. But at the same time, if you need something more stable than that, looking to CentOS or um, other reputable ones, CentOS is just the first one off the top of my head because I guess I'm a Red Hat guy. Uh, um, those, those type of distributions might be something to consider. And maybe you really, really hate Red Hat, maybe you hate RPMs, but it's Linux, and it's not Windows. So it's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, bonus tip, a lot of times you have to keep in mind certification processes when doing development for uh, software, hardware, whatever uh, you're doing. And then if you throw a Windows distribution on a, a piece of hardware you've worked on and offer support for it, it's going to be a real pain at this point to offer uh, support for that uh, piece very long because, for one, the two stable ones that everybody loves to use, Windows XP, Windows 7, licenses are getting really hard to find. Um, XP mode in Windows 7, and if Windows 8 has it. It's nice, but it's not exactly the same, and even still, uh, XP 64-bit, I mean, it had, it had its issues too. So um, also, if you really are irritated by that telemetry, telemetry thing, Windows 7 is, if you've taken security updates, it's no better anymore, so think about that. Or go read the updates and all of the legal jargon, and. You'll see what I mean. Windows 10, it's not stable. Sure, there's the, what is it, the professional version where you can delay updates now for a few months. That's still not stable. You've got to 
find something that can maintain, uh, you can maintain and not have to worry about updates or ensure that the updates aren't gonna break whatever you're working on. And if they do break, you can go back to that previous version of the software. And for the sake of it, I had to throw Max in there. Uh, why pay, that's probably not the right number, but essentially $10,000 uh, for a computer. And then another $1,000 for the uh, monitor stand. Not the monitor, the stand. Uh, if any of you have seen that, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when you can, for that price, which might be, the $10,000 might be a little oversold, but for $10,000, you can buy eight Dell Latitudes buy docking stations for all of them and buy a second monitor so you can do dual screen for all of them and just install Linux distribution. And for a small company, that's a much, much more efficient use of the money when mu that level of finances actually matters. So also, and, and that leads somewhat as a stepping stone into uh, dealing with those people who dislike Linux. They're not scared of it. It's not because they don't think, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to screw something up. It's because they, they either had maybe somebody from the community. I think we've all been online and seen one of those, what I would refer to as toxic forums, where somebody asks a question. They're new. They don't, they don't want to be told to go read the manual. They're, and somebody just might say the wrong thing. Uh, and that can really alienate a person and just identify everything Linux as toxic. And, um, or maybe even they picked that wrong distribution uh, that was just on that one bad version. For example, um, when I was doing my master's on uh, medieval literature, I had Fedora 24, and by the time I was finished 25, 25 was amazingly stable upgraded to 26 eventually, and I think the most stable version after that was 29. Anyways, I was, um, I was really new to Linux at that point. My dad, who's sitting in the audience, uh, was so kind enough to help me along with as much of it as I could, but when I go back to college, I'm on my own. So everybody I talked to if that used Linux was telling me, use Ubuntu, use Ubuntu. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll try Ubuntu. So I get a virtual machine, install it, and I'm sure there's Ubuntu users in the audience, and it, I'm sure it works really, really well for you guys. Does anybody use Ubuntu? Okay, yeah. And I used it a couple months ago to do, uh, I think I got a Nexus 4 and installed a Ubuntu Touch, and I had to use Ubuntu to do that. Um, but the, when I installed the Ubuntu, Ubuntu a few years ago when it was still on Unity, it, I couldn't even find the calculator. And that might have just been my computer illiteracy. It took me a while to find a, a LibreOffice writer, and it just seemed to me that it was not where uh, the most popular at the time uh, Linux desktop should really be. And it, it could have even been because I was running it in a virtual machine. But the point is, somebody had a bad experience with an actually interacting with Linux. So, two possibilities. Um, and the solution to this is a little bit trickier because these people ha have this mental wall that I mentioned. It's strong and their logic is not a thing within their sites when addressing the issues. So, um, but we still have to try, right? Uh, for the sake of our companies, for the sake of our honor. Uh, and in 2011, uh, uh, were, you any, were any of you here for 2011 Southeast Linux Fest? All right, cool. Um, well, neither was I, so. Uh, but you can find these videos on YouTube. And one of them was by a very famous Mad Dog Call. It's been with Linux since the start. And I had already planned to use pragmatic linguistics to some extent in this speech, but when he said this phrase, which is the title of the slide, don't be, fr don't be a fanatic, be pragmatic, that was instantly sold. I'm like, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and talking about here. So um, we're all fanatic, we're all passionate about the subject, otherwise we wouldn't have come to the conference uh, festival. So 
there is that fanatic side, but when you let it show in a professional environment or somebody who's anti-Linux for the reason that they're, they think it's a bad thing, then showing that enthusiasm isn't always the best approach. And another way of phrasing this is, or it's not really, I think Richard Stallman has a different mentality. He's just very, very passionate about free and open source. And I think he uses a different phrase. But either way, um, focusing on the free and open sourceness of Linux, it's not going to be effective here. I hate it because that was one of the things that made me really like Linux. If I didn't understand something, my dad knows C, my dad knows assembly. He, so he, in theory, he could do some kernel stuff. But if you, even if you just look at the software by itself, um, somebody could go and look at that for me if whatever it's written in and tell me. If I'm, if I'm worried about this program and something it's doing behind the scenes, they can go and look at it for me. I can't program. I dabble in HTML. But generally speaking, the community as a whole can be kind of the checks and balances for this stuff. Um, an example, I th the Microsoft C compiler for uh, Linux, Microsoft released one, but it has data telemetry collection, and you can't really turn it off. If you do, it turns itself back on in a month or two when it updates, and it's just not worth it. Um, anyways, um, but since it's open source, we can do all that and check all that, but making that argument to somebody who doesn't like Linux their hatred for Linux is based on something other than the fact, oh, we can read the code. That was in the 1990s, that argument's over. So now we've got to move on to performance, I would say. Um, and I think we can all, or not all, but some of us would agree that Linux is a lot more flexible. We can do more, we have more choices. We have infinitely more distributions. If you don't have a distribution you like, you can create your own. So there's infinite possibilities to what you can do with it, essentially. But um, they're not going to look at it that way. They're just going to assume, oh, I just have one OS, and that means this is better. Sometimes uh, modularity is a good thing. Uh, moving on to the, ling the linguistic part of this talk, though, uh, I have a book in my backpack, but I'm not going to move out of the camera site to get it. It's called Principles of Pragmatics. It's a very academic-y linguistic textbook written in the 1980s, I think 1983. And essentially, it added to this concept of being cooperative in conversation and how to effectively communicate. Um, and pragmatic linguistics is essentially the study of uh, language use in actual settings, like when it's actually being used. Um, there's four principles to the cooperative uh, principle, and there's four principles to the politeness principle. If I were to put those very academic descriptions up here and explain them, it, my talk would be over. But, and I want to give a little bit more insight uh, and kind of help you guys get the gist. So I summarized them and did three bullet points each best I can. When you're being cooperative, uh, when you want to be cooperative in a conversation about Linux with somebody who doesn't like it, you want to make sure you're, both sides are willing to discuss. The guy might be very closed-minded, or the girl, whoever you're talking to. They might be closed-minded, and they might just be like, I'm not changing my mind here. But if they're just willing to talk, talk to them, see what you can find out. Uh, both sides have to take it seriously. Um, my summary of this is essentially, you can't talk to trolls. There's just no reasoning with them. They're there literally just to make your life harder. Um, summarizing the cooperative principle, though, I think the most important thing out of it is to allow that other individual to make them think they have the authority in the conversation and they're giving you information. So let's say this guy comes up and says, wow, you're using Linux, you suck. And then um, you turn around in your office chair. Hopefully, it's a wheelie chair so you can do little spins. Um, but you turn around and you look them dead in the eye 
or not if they don't like eye contact or you don't like eye contact. And you just ask them, what, why does it mix up? Uh, and some of us, I know when Windows 8 hit, we, we decided this Windows 8 stuff, slowing, slowing us down, whatever. That's when a lot of us made the jump to Linux. And you can use that background if you have it, or if, if you don't, just lie and be like, oh yeah, I used to use Linux. No, I didn't. Um, you, can, you can say, or Windows, you used to use Windows. When, even if you didn't, and be like, it worked well, and then Linux worked better for me. Maybe Windows is better now, which we all know it's probably not. Uh, at least not from the free and open source side, which is what a lot of us care about. Um, but try and get them to talk about what they like about Windows and, and, like, and be interested in it. Like, oh wow, that's really cool that Windows does that. I don't think Linux used to do that, but I think it might now. And you're starting a dialogue there, and they, if you ask them to show you, like, if you say Windows didn't do that when I used it, let me see it do it now, he comes and shows you on his laptop, and you're just like, oh wow, but I had to use this workaround for that on Linux. You're creating a dialogue and you're showing them how Linux works, and they, don't, they may not care at the moment, but they're gonna remember that. You're not being a jerk to them, you're communicating enthusiastically, you're talking about them, you're letting them talk about themselves, and then you're like, oh cool, that's, this is my alternative, and at worst case, you make a friend. Um, so, I think I explained a little bit of the politeness principle there. Maybe not, okay. So, when it comes to politeness, first thing, don't take criticism personally. When they come up and tell you your distribution sucks or Linux in general sucks, they say, why, why are you doing this to the company? Just use Windows like the rest of the workflow, please. And uh, you just you just don't want to. You know you know that you have the ability to do more than they do on Linux, more flexibility. Um, but taking an eye, taking an eye for an eye. I'm sure everyone's heard that phrase before. Yes, hope, hopefully. Um, they insult you. Insulting them back isn't going to do anything. If anything, it's just going to piss them off more. So don't. Don't instigate the situation further, even though they're the instigator. Just let them have their moment. You're, you're, you know when you're in this situation, you're in control. You're the smart person here. Let, just let them get their venting out. Um, and next thing is, like I said before, during my explanation of the pro tip, I, sub, I guess I called it, um, give credit where credit's due. Sometimes I know it's very proprietary and uh, very irritating to you to have to create accounts, but sometimes Windows does do things better right now. Um, they have more people working on projects, they have more money to throw at projects, and as irritating as that is, it's going to give results that sometimes come out a little better. Um, not for the majority of the time, I think. I think there's usually a sufficient enough use for Linux or a solution in Linux, but to fight, to fight them on, oh, I have this alternative, is it's not making the community better in the sense that you're opening a new person up to Linux. You're, saying, you're still keeping your wall up and saying, hey, I have this way and it's working for me, so I don't want to hear about your way. Um, Windows does something well, give it to them, like, wow, that's really cool, I wish Linux did that, or I wish Fedora or Ubuntu, whatever you're using, did that, and maybe even explain to them if, they, if, they, if they're a developer, you can be like, maybe if you know anything about how this app or software works, maybe you could help contribute to Linux and say, maybe write some of the code and help start a project that would implement that feature app in, into Linux be really, it would make them feel good, like, hey, I could have a purpose here. Or um, at, minimum it would, at minimum, it would stroke their ego. And I, again, uh, it's not always fun to do that, but when someone's ego is stroked and they're like, oh yeah, I'm the smart person in this conversation, they, they let their guard down a little because they, 
they think they have that one up on you when in reality you're just working behind the scenes and kind of working them. So uh, give credit where credit's due or sometimes even when it's not due. Uh, but if they're not gonna get what you're talking about, just let them have the credit for then. Um, this is a lovely picture of Sheriff Andy Taylor from The Andy Griffith Show. I'm sure some of you have seen this before, 1960s. Uh, one of my favorite shows, uh, admittedly, I, admittedly I haven't watched it in a while, but if you know Sheriff Andy Taylor, he does a lot of really sneaky things. He comes off as a pretty laid back guy, just wanting to keep the peace in Mayberry, North Carolina actually. Hey, I'm from Atlanta, so it's cool that I'm talking about this in the state that it's actually happening in. So, or the show fictionally took place. But anyways, um, what Sheriff Andy Taylor does when he sees something going down in his family, like with his son Opie or Aunt B, when he sees something that's wrong he doesn't like, he doesn't go up and tell him, hey, I don't think that's a good idea. Stop doing that. That's bad. I'm the sheriff. I will arrest you if you do not stop selling fruit on the side of the street where shops are down on the next road. Uh, that's just the most re recent episode I've seen. But anyways, instead of doing that, he pitches questions here and there, like questions that will help the individual that he's talking to come to that conclusion that what they're doing is wrong on their own. And I'm not saying that Windows is wrong, per se. I'm just saying, like, plugging, that, pl plugging Linux into this hypothetical Andy Taylor situation or Andy Griffith situation, if you ask the right questions over time, and the questions are going to be different based on the pro project or app or whatever you're talking about with the per your team, you, uh, an individual, what, whatever it is, the questions are going to be different every time, but asking the right questions to help them get to the point where they realize there's a problem with using Windows in this given situation. Windows won't be, this, what we're using today might, on Windows 10, six months down the road when our business version of Windows is forced to be updated, something could change. Uh, something could change and it won't, and our app won't work anymore on the hardware we just provided them, our clients with. Thinking, thinking about it like that, uh, and it doesn't have to be that specific example. You know your projects and your work environment better than I do, but getting them to come to the problem on their own instead of just upright telling them, hey, this is the problem, we need to fix it. Let's use Linux to do that. Help them realize the problem on their own, and half the time this is gonna send them into some kind of like frantic, oh crap, what do we do? Other half of the time they'll just be like, oh, maybe, maybe we need to explore other options. And this could lead to, it might not be them installing it on their com work computer, but um, looking to the, going back to a few slides back, uh, except that these people aren't hopping onto Linux enthusiastically, they're doing it for a work project. It's not about free and open source software for them, it's about getting paid. So if those, if those people are willing to download VirtualBox, download, I guess GNOME boxes won't run on Windows, so, uh, but downloading VirtualBox, that's basically universally known as the best virtual machine. Um, and installing Fedora, Fedora, whatever um, distribution that the department as a whole agrees to use. That's a step in the right direction. Um, so looking to the bottom point, baby steps are progress. Even if person still doesn't like Linux, they'll walk into the office every day and be like, I hate my life, I'm using Linux. They're using Linux. So you won in, in that battle. So um, they may not acknowledge it, and also, if they do start using Linux, that's awesome. You may not get the credit for bringing them over, and everybody likes to be well known. Um, I say this somewhat hesita hesitantly, uh, and I love listening to podcasts, I love listening to YouTube channels, all that stuff. 
But if you want credit for helping the Linux community, start a podcast, start a YouTube channel, start some kind of talk show. You'll get credit, you'll help the Linux community that way. And it's really fun. I love listening to that stuff. Everybody, I'm sure, likes, likes it a little bit. Whether you're developer, master of the C language, what be you, if you don't even know that much about Linux at all and you're just interested, that YouTube, I can't tell you how much I've learned about Linux off of YouTube. It's amazing. But mentioning, but on this topic, it can't always, about, it can't always be about getting credit. Sometimes we have to sacrifice you getting that golden star or me getting that golden star, whoever helped that person get onto Linux. We have to sacrifice that thank you that we want, subconsciously maybe even, but you gotta sacrifice that to sometimes improve the community. And with all of us being here, being passionate about it, I think it's a very small price to pay. Um, and I hope no uh, YouTubers or uh, podcasters or show talk people, journalists take that the wrong way. Um, my point there is mainly that there's certain battles that are won publicly on those type of venues and then there's others that are better placed through just one-on-one -on -one just being kind to a person and being open to them. So, and re-emphasizing when's the right time, when's the right place. Don't go into your meeting of colleagues thinking, oh crap, we have this project due in a week, what are we gonna do? Thinking, hey, I'm gonna walk in and sell them Linux. <laughs> Cause even if you succeed there, half of them are gonna resent you for it. It might, it might win the battle, might solve the problem for the project, but the amount of stress that it caused them for that week and a half where they were scrambling to get a virtual machine going, getting stuff developed, stuff like that, it's, it internally just stresses them out and they want to leave Linux again as soon as possible. You don't want somebody who just finished their project like, that's done, I cannot get this virtual machine off my computer as soon as, like I cannot get this off as sooner than, I can't remember what I was gonna say. Uh, I can't get it off soon enough, there, yeah. But um, you don't want that mentality. You, even if um, they don't like Linux still, them forgetting about it, wanting to go home and sleep for the next day, then they wake up and like, oh, that, that VM is still here. They may power it up again just now that they're not stressed anymore. They can experience that GNOME desktop environment, KDE, whatever distro you led the company to use. They may power it up and just play around with it, see what it's actually about outside of the project. It's happened before. I've personally helped someone with it before uh, at Georgia State. They were curious and they're, they're not using Linux right now. Uh, I think they're using a MacBook right now, yeah but they tried it. They were open and it was a step in the right direction and they don't fear it anymore. They're like, this is a tool that I could use if I continue learning to program or uh, just want to change on my computer. So um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's all I have to say on the matter. I think there's 10-ish minutes, give or take, left. Questions, comments, feedback. Go for it. You know you've won when you see your memes tweeted back to you without what? Without attribution. That, I've heard that before and that is, now that I think about it, that is amazingly true and a perfect, perfect phrase to go along with this. Very, very cool. Anybody? I 
I to totally, I agree. Yeah, I, sometimes just casually without there being a problem, just min occasionally bringing up, hey, I just did this really awesome thing. Uh, come check it out, and then it's interesting. They may roll their eyes, oh, it's on Linux. Who cares? It's, you're happy with it, you feel accomplished. And that when that Linux hater just watched Linux, something happened on it. So at minimum, you won that won that satisfaction if you're that bitter, uh, maniacal individual like I am. So um, anyone else? Okay, I guess I very thoroughly covered it. <laughs> Anything confusing? Or any problems you'd like to discuss as a probably 30-ish uh, team of dedicated Linux users? All right, awesome. Uh,